you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So get your deal by clicking the link in the description below. This is my dog, Atlas. He's the goodest of boys and my absolute best friend, and he's very excited to share this week's sponsor, Atlas VPN, because of course they share a name. Atlas VPN was developed by top cybersecurity specialists and IT engineers. Atlas VPN was created to make the internet accessible and secure for everyone. Currently, it has more than 6 million users worldwide. They have blazingly fast speeds so you can stream your favorite shows or upgrade your gaming experience at lightning fast speed. With Atlas VPN, you can protect all your vices with a single subscription, so your phone, your computer, whatever you need, it's protected. Atlas VPN is more than just a VPN. It blocks all malicious links, ads, trackers, and notifies you when someone's trying to steal your data. It also allows you to get the best deals when shopping online, including online subscriptions like Netflix and Spotify, airlines, hotels, and more. So right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Time is running out, though, so get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below. So thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this week's video. Now, back to the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. So lots of uh, updates this week, for sure. Tons of that. A little bit of work on a really cool project, uh, the mantle for the neighbor. We'll get into that at some point. But one thing I actually forgot to report to you guys that actually happened last week was we finally got the new gutters on the back. They look great. We got the, the round down pipes uh, and the gutters are at least double, I think, the size. They were originally four inch gutters up there and I believe they're eight inches now. Uh, they're brown, they match the building a lot better, they look better aesthetically, and actually I was able to keep the original hoops that held the original downspouts on. So even with my gutters, I strove to at least save what was savable about the structure of the building. So quite happy with that. They look great. And uh, so far, with the few rainstorms we have had, I've had zero issues, no more waterfalls on the inside of my house, which is amazing. Ooh, yes, and before we get too far into the episode, uh, there was a really, really big thing that happened this week as far as the history part of this entire channel goes. Uh, of course, directly relating to the house, directly relating to Mr. Brown, um, but uh, watch to the end, that'll all be over there. Mansard roof updates. This is actually the pattern at the very, very top of the roof. 
Uh, you can see it at the line up there. I'll insert some drone footage right now um, and show you guys uh, what this, uh, these pieces are actually for. You can see I have five of them. I've started putting wood life on them, which is a wood preservative and a insecticide. So no bugs will be eating my beautiful, beautiful woodwork and we'll get another hundred or so years out of it. But my historic carpenter, his daughter actually helps him with a lot of things. Her name is Claire. She's the one who cut all these beautiful pieces. She made one template and literally this is just all jigsaw work. <laughs> You know, one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. It's a lot of repetitive motions, and I think she really, really knocked it out of the park. Um, and it's ex basically exactly what was up there. Uh, you know, any kind of little minor imperfection. I mean, this is almost 50 feet in the air. It's at the very, very top of the roof. Um, it's only like three boards down from being the absolute top of the roof. So these are going to look absolutely gorgeous. Claire, if you're watching for any reason, you knocked it out of the park. And I am quite excited to see these little beauties going back up on the roof uh, to complete this grand old lady's grand old crown and uh, make the house whole again. And for those who don't know about my historic carpenter, Eric, he actually uses and cuts a lot of this wood on Holland Brown equipment. So while the individual cuts with the jigsaw are not Holland Brown, the actual molding piece underneath was uh, molded on a Holland Brown molder. <laughs> so it's really cool, I think. Like, I can't get over the fact that I'm able to put this man's house back together with his tools. So I, uh, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, I mean, who else? What other house, what other project can anybody say that with where you can use a guy who died almost 100 years ago, who made tools way over 100 years ago, um, his tools still being around? Uh, and we're able to put back his, his first house he built with his tools. Um, you know, I don't know of any other project <laughs> where you could do that. Um, but I got really uh, lucky in the fact that this house is a still here. Mr. Brown, you know, built some amazing machines that are still here and that people still love and care for these things and uh, kept up with the machines enough that they still function. Of course, they're built like tanks. They're so what you could really probably do to break one uh, other than actual crushing or melting it. Um, and that, you know, this, this old girl's still here and uh, that I can continue on telling his legacy through his tools and, and through his house. What a cool story, I just love it.
So behind me here is my neighbor's mantle that I've been working on this week. Before we get too deep into that, yes, the plumbers were here this week. There are trenches and big holes, and my basement's been quite ripped apart this week. Uh, I'd love to go down and show it to you guys, but there aren't any lights down there, so it's impossible. The plan was to show you guys at least the holes that have been dug, but then the power went out. So what we're looking at here may not look remarkable, and that's because it really isn't. This is actually the back side or the side that would be attached to the wall of the mantle. Uh, you'd have your you know, fire insert here, firebox, uh, your actual fireplace here, um, and the top of the mantle is actually here. Um, but let's start with this. This thing was a bit of a wreck. Mostly because the old glue that was here um, was completely shot and just they, these broke apart really easily. Uh, also, there seems to be some kind of warping. I don't know if some water got onto this, but these boards had warped quite dramatically to the point where we can see here, of course it's right in the shadow, but if you can kind of see the line that my thumb's making here, that's a big split. Um, because these are kind of tongue and groove, you can see the split here. I've also saturated the heck out of this thing with lots of glue trying to get this to stay. I had to go get some uh, larger clamps because I don't have 48 inch clamps and actually having something slightly over 48 inches would have been more ideal for this, uh, but I made it work anyways. I did have to add a bracing board here just to keep it together. Um, and there still needs to be some little corrections, but but I have everything glued up, including all the brakes and stuff. And when I put it back together, everything just broke again. And those things dried for two days. Um, and it's type bond, uh, type on four, I believe. This is the waterproof one. Uh, it's good stuff. I've never had any problems with it. I've always seen the wood break around it, never the glue itself. It's the first project where I've kind of had it give up on me a little bit, which is somewhat worrisome. And there definitely are some things to correct here now, but overall, this mantle is looking a lot better than it did, that's for sure. Let me flip, flip it around and we'll get to the pretty part, shall we? So, while there are problems, it does look better than it did when I got it. So, uh, obviously this thing was completely painted. Um, if you, for whatever reason, get it in your head that you really wanna paint something, if it is something like this with really heavy detail, note that every time you paint that, paint just gets in between there, gets in all the cracks and the crevices, and it is the <laughs> least fun thing to clean that paint out of. It's really difficult to get every bit of it, and then it makes every single one of those little pieces look like they're outlined in white, um, or whatever color whoever you tried to use. Uh, it's unfortunate because the wood here is extraordinarily beautiful. It's just got covered up over years and years, and uh, yeah, it didn't do it any favors. So here's my problem area. As you can see, nice big crack here, nice big crack here. Both of these two cracks were actually fixed and corrected before I glued this thing up. Um, could I have maybe prevented it in this process? Potentially. Uh, the key is definitely adding the bracing that I added back there. I'm going to add another one as well. Um, I would have already done that, but again, power out. Uh, that piece just happened to be very close to the right size. The ones I have to cut now are larger pieces, and uh, none of my saws were able to be powered, so <laughs> I wasn't able to fix it really quickly. Uh, another frustrating thing. So that means I will have to do some post-mortem correction. I don't know if that's not the correct term, but it's what I'm using right now. Um, this should be fairly easy. Uh, I just need to get some glue in behind there and clamp this forward. As you can see, there's actually not a whole lot of flex going on there. I can pretty much solve it by just pushing it in with my fingers. So not too bad there. Uh, do note the lighting is quite harsh here, so that ridge probably looks deeper than it actually is. Again, still not good, I know. If we go to the other side, that's much better looking, but while this side will never look quite as good as that side because it is broken and therefore you will still always be able to find the crack, I'm hoping to eliminate most of that. Then this one is the real bummer because I actually had this one looking really, really nice before I did the glue up and just a little bit of wiggle and it cracked right off again. And again, I've never seen Titebond fail like this, so this is a really hastily 
extra glue thrown in sort of solution. Just, you know, this was Caleb, uh, <laughs> this was panic mode a little bit, let's say. Um, so am I proud of my work here? Absolutely not. Can I fix what I've done here? Absolutely. Um, so it's just going to require a decent amount more sanding. However, it will be more structurally sound than it has been in a long time. Essentially, the only thing that was holding this whole piece together is the mantle here. And so I believe, I believe terminology wise, the top piece, which fits flat, is the actual mantle. The rest of this is what I believe is called a surround. Uh, please feel free to correct me in the comments. But I do think that's correct. So basically, this is what was holding everything together. Once I took this off, everything basically shattered on this one side. Um, so it was a big mess to begin with. The main reason I'm actually doing this piece right now is because her carpenter is trying to get the measurements to put it back in. Um, and of course, when I heard that news, I wanted to rush to make sure I could give it back to her. Um, you know, you want to do good by your neighbors. If she needs it back, well, then I need to complete it. At the end of the day, I took the project on. I wanted to help out my neighbor um, and I wanted to look good for her, you know? It's one of those things, sometimes you gotta put what you got going on slightly on the back burner so you can make somebody else's day brighter. So uh, that's actually, that's, that's really all I'm doing here. It's just trying to make somebody else's uh, life a little nicer, a little easier. So for the mantle top itself, I did have to do a patch here. Um, yes, it is a wee bit crude. Um, I didn't really have any, well, I actually, I actually believe I misspoke in one of the last videos and called this mahogany. Uh, I am under the assumption that it is not mahogany. I believe it is actually cherry. Um, again, I've said it a thousand times, I'm no wood expert. Um, but the colors are actually pretty close. Um, once I get a little bit of shellac on there, this is just a little test bit of shellac. And I had to stain this a little bit darker, actually use some Danish oil. Um, but no worries, the nice thing about shellac, at least the de-wax shellac, is that it will basically stick to anything. It's very sticky stuff, uh, great for uses like this. And uh, actually the original finish on this piece was shellac because I found it under um, some of the areas where the boards would screw on top of other boards. Um, but while the color doesn't match super well, I think my profile here ended up matching very well. So you see there's the split, the difference, and uh, new work old work. Uh, luckily, the router bit I had was very close to the original. Just a little bit of light sanding to uh, make the two look pretty good, and I'm quite, quite happy with that. Uh, color matching, not perfect, but uh, that, that, uh, but that uh, profile there, I'm massively happy with. Um, also, whoever uh, suggested shellac sticks, I do like them. Yes, I needed a lighter color for this job, but I wanted to test it anyways. Um, had a little mistake here with the router, which, you know, is to be expected. But again, the piece is quite old. And um, yeah, it'll still look great. Now for the rounded or oval shaped mirror, uh, or pill shaped or elongated pill shaped um, mirror, this is the pieces here. Of course, once I took it apart, it also decided to fall apart but uh, I can make a really good example of something here. Because there was a bigger crack opened here, whoever painted this piece got a bunch of paint in there. Now, when this piece is together with this piece and you're trying to dig the paint out of here, uh, essentially good luck, like you just can't. Basically, when paint gets down here this far, it's a take apart the piece, clean the paint out of the crack, put it all back together, um, that's really all you can do because I don't care how long you scrape, you're never gonna get that all out of there until you take it apart. So basically what I'm saying is if you want to paint a piece of furniture that's really delicate and has lots of little cracks and stuff in it like this, maybe reconsider um, because somebody in the future, if they ever want to return to, <laughs> if they ever want to return that piece to a normal unpainted piece, the amount of work and time and labor they're going to have to put into that piece. <sighs> so if you got something that's pine, you know, hey, go for it. You know, cheap wood, that's fine. Um, but if you got a hardwood piece like this, like a cherry piece or a mahogany piece, or especially something like a walnut piece, 
yeah, maybe don't do that. <laughs> I'm not telling anybody how to live their life or anything like that, each to their own. Uh, but something that has a lot of little intricate pieces like this, um, you're definitely going to make a lot of work for somebody in the future. So that's what's going on with my neighbor's mantle. I'm very close to done with it. I probably need about two more days of work. Um, we'll see how hard those next two days of work are because this is up here on the second floor. I'm actually in the library right now. And this entire next week is supposed to be well over 100 degrees. Not looking forward to it. It's going to be a bit rough. Um, so I might be dripping in sweat, but I swear I will get this mantle done. So next week, lots of pretty you know, shellacking, and then I'm gonna put a coat of water locks on it to waterproof this thing. Normally I would just wax it but she wants to have it in her bathroom or the room that this was in will be her bathroom. Um, so I want to make for sure it has a waterproof coating on it that will handle the elements a little bit better than just plain old shellac. So that's the goal here. It will be done next week. I am at the Missouri Historical Society and uh, they've got some really cool items. You might've known that uh, if you had watched a few episodes back, I actually showed you guys some photos of some really cool items that they had that were uh, personally Mr. Brown's. Uh, well, I'm here to see them today, so let's get at that. All right, guys, so we have quite the spread here. Uh, believe it or not, these are Mr. Brown's uh, personal effects. Uh, his hand tools, uh, you know, molding planers, like we have some at the house, um, you know, more regular planers. Uh, these two items are particularly special, but we're gonna get back to those in a moment. I just wanna show you guys some of his other planers over here. It's really cool because Neil actually sent me a lot of uh, the molding planers that look extremely similar to this, and I've been kind of, you know, looking at them and playing around with them, trying to understand them. And it's cool to know that Mr. Brown himself was using the exact same planers. I believe they're manufactured by the same person, in fact. Um, this being an Atkinson, this being an Atkinson uh, made piece, which is really cool. And I mean, the size of these, like I'm assuming this is around 1860s or so tech, maybe 1870s and they're absolutely wonderful. But the really cool thing is, I mean, Mr. Brown held these and made things with them. They're his personal tools, which, you know, to me guys, makes it 10 times more special. But as awesome as these are, let's go to the two really amazing pieces over here. This molding planer is a little bigger than the other two, but it's really special because I looked at all the other ones and I could not find any markings of any, or I couldn't find any markings that had anything to do with brown. But if we look at the side on this one, you can see just here, it says Chaz S. Brown. You can see it in the little hex marks. Uh, you can see it kind of pattern. It goes this way and then it goes across the top. Might be really difficult to see. Hopefully uh, I can blow it up slightly for you guys. Of course I am in a museum I, so I cannot touch the pieces. So a little difficult to get it for you guys, but hopefully you can see that. So uh, <laughs> not only is that one his personal tool, that one has his name on it. To be honest guys, I'm kind of fangirling a little bit because this is the coolest stuff I've ever seen. <laughs> but I've left the very, very best for last um, and that was a pocket watch that uh, Hall actually gave to Brown on Christmas of 1884. Um, so let's have a look at that. So here's the watch here guys. If you can see on the face right there, that I believe is uh, his wife, Sarah. Um, that would be the only photo I have of her other than the one that's out front of the house where the family was out there. Uh, of course, the one that's the channel logo. Um, but you can't really see anybody's faces super duper well. So this would be the, the only time I've really been able to see a clear photo of her. Um, which also helps in the fact that if I ever do get the time to do a painting of Mr. Brown or Mr. and Mrs. Brown, like I want to for the house, um, I actually have reference for her, which is really, really great. So this piece is like the holy grail to me. It's every bit of the history that we've dug up for the house combined into one amazing piece. 
So if we look at the back here, guys, and again, it is really shiny, so it might be somewhat hard to make out, but it says presented by, or presented to, sorry, Charles S. Brown by G.O. Hall. It says on the bottom there, December 25th, 1884. So this was given by Hall to Brown uh, for Christmas as a Christmas gift. And uh, if we can close the case, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and, and to think, like this, this was in the house. Mr. Brown had this in the house. This was his personal effect. He probably wore this to the factory several times. If not, you know, something that he wore quite often. I mean, who's to say necessarily? Um, I mean, these items came here. Uh, this one, I believe, came from Alfred, his uh, oldest surviving son, his youngest son, but oldest surviving son. Um, and these actually came from Alfred's wife. They were donated to the museum. Uh, this in the late 50s and this in the early 60s. So these items came to be part of the collection here, part of the history of the city. Um, you know, and of course we brought our own personal effects here, our own little collection, but it's kind of cool to see them married back together. Yeah, this is uh, certainly a, a, a beat to remember. It's, oh man, it's so cool. Um, hopefully I can come back and visit it here and there. Like I do the graves, you know? So that's the end of the episode, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed that last little trip to the museum as thoroughly as I did. So have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week, and I'll see you guys again real soon. Bye-bye. Take care.